welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming in. Um, we're 36 minutes behind schedule, and I was told we were just gonna skip lunch, so sorry about that. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're still gonna have lunch, but we need to get started. Um, so the title of the panel is Popular Justice and State Justice, and the first presenter is my uh, good friend and um, assistant professor at, in Sociology and Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Georgia, Jorge Derpic. Go ahead. All right, thank you very much um, for the opportunity of being here. Thank you to the organizers and to the wonderful team that has accompanied them. Um, my paper deals with the judicial aftermath of three mob violence events that took place in rural areas of Bolivia back in 2009, and whose processes, judicial processes, extended at least until 2016, which is the time in which I left fieldwork. It is possible that they are still undergoing. Um, specifically, I'm interested in asking, um, in answering two questions. First, how direct and indirect participants of these acts of violence make sense of them? And second, how their interpretations lead them to mobilize the rhetoric and procedures of ordinary or indigenous native peasant justice known as HIOC by its acronym in Spanish. Uh, and also how they develop or deploy a series of strategies of collective action that um, seek basically three purposes. First, um, they, um, they, they, they look for protection from the state, they seek to punish the perpetrators of mob violence, and also they want to avoid punishment to the perpetrators of mob violence. I want to talk a little bit about the data. These are three cases that come from a larger data set and from the graphic field work um, that I uh, obtained in El Alto. And I chose them specifically because they share three specific characteristics. They took place in rural areas but ended up at the prosecutor's offices, office of the city of El Alto. The perpetrators of these acts collectively resisted or mobilized against prosecutorial investigations that were taking place within the ordinary justice system. And the perpetrators demanded respect, or some sort of respect, to their autonomy, either through official documents addressed to prosecutors or through collective action. I'm going to argue that the participants, the direct and indirect participants of mob violence in rural areas of Bolivia, show a twofold engagement to both ordinary justice and HIOC. While on one hand, the perpetrators challenged the state monopoly of or legitimate violence by participating in these acts, but also by seeking to avoid punishment and deploying a series of strategies to avoid this, this punishment. On the other hand, the targets acknowledge this primacy of the, the primacy of the state power and do in fact expect state authorities to exert or to impose their prerogatives on the legitimate use of violence. In doing so, participants, perpetrators, and targets um, exhibit a strategic engagement with these forms of justice. And such engage engagement is influenced by long-term repertoires of, repertoires of interaction with the state, like a history of ways in which they deal and know and understand how the state is weak in certain aspects, recent legal reforms that took place in Bolivia within the last decade, local and factional interests that take place in these specific communities, patronage politics, and also the limitations of state institutions. So I'm arguing that all these, we should take into consideration all these factors um, to understand this strategic engagement of individuals, perpetrators, and targets of mob violence in terms of their interaction or their engagement with ordinary justice and HIOC. So to give you a little bit of context, and I'm going to talk about this very briefly. Again, we're talking about a context that has nothing to do with the level of violence that we've been talking about within, within these two days. We're talking about non-state, non-armed state, non-state actors. So there is not this challenge or this overt challenge to state power in that sense. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is like, in 2009, in 2010, Bolivia uh, launched a series of new legal reforms 
that changed the nature of HIOC, or indigenous justice in this world, community justice as we know it, uh, uh, popularly. Um, the, fir the first change was that, that HIOC would achieve equal status to the ordinary justice system, so the state acknowledges that or recognizes that indigenous peoples can rule themselves, uh, but only in cases that do not affect human rights, that do not challenge private property, or that do not affect the state control of natural resources, meaning that individuals uh, who live in rural communities cannot rule on cases related to homicide, to murder, to land seizures, or even to uh, uh, privatize, uh, related to privatization of natural resources. And in terms of mob violence, the Constitution and a specific law, a specific law uh, that deals with the boundaries between these two systems addresses or states that mob violence is illegal, that it's, it's unacceptable because it's a violation of human rights, and that it should be punished through the ordinary justice system. So this specific statement comes in part because there is a um, conflation between uh, mob violence and community justice that takes place, uh, takes place at different levels. Not only on the side of external actors who attribute community violence or community justice um, uh, to, to violence, but also for the very actors that engage in these practices. And there's a lot of debate about it, we can talk about more about that if you have any questions on the Q&A, but I'm just going to leave it there for now. Um, so within this broader context, I chose these three cases that took place close by to the city of Elato. The red dot that you see there is the city of Elato, where, where Elato is located, it's in the highlands of Bolivia, and the three cases took place in these surrounding areas. The, one, the point to the right here, um, though it's seemingly close to Alauto, it's a location that actually uh, you need to travel for eight hours to get to the city of Alauto because of the quality of roads. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just going to present each of the, like a very superficial account of each of the cases. Uh, I'm going to try to go very fast through this, uh, these features and just to give you uh, a general idea of what I'm talking about here. So the case, the first case uh, took place in Atacachi in November of 2008. There was a celebration and 2,000, more than 2,000 individuals, at least that's what accounts say in the, in the case file, took justice into their own hands against 11, a, a gang of 11, 11 individuals who allegedly were taking advantage of the celebration to steal or rob people at this location. After the attack, uh, nine people survived, nine of the 11, but two died. So the targets, the surviving targets, while they recover and after recovering, um, reach out to the state prosecutor to follow up or to start a case for homicide, but also for injuries, bodily injuries. The second case that took place in Tukuyu in July of 2009 uh, takes us to a moment where members of the community attacked alleged robbers who were also members of the community, a father who was 64 and a son that was 40, and the perpetrators, besides beating them and attacking them physically, took the son's car and uh, basically evicted the family from the community. They took the father's home and, uh, and the land property he owned. The targets who survived the attack also reached out to the prosecutor office and started the process to get their stuff back and receive some form of restitution. In the third case, from October of 2009, <coughs> Community leaders started on their own, because the, of the absence of police presence, uh, started an investigation um, for the robbery of uh, computer equipment in their local school. After 21 days of starting this investigation, they um, identified the main or one of the main perpetrators, beat him, and murdered him, um, and buried, buried him inside the, in the local cemetery. The family of the target who was victim of a previous attack by this. Uh, community members managed to escape and also reached out to the local ombudsman that they did it in El Alto, eight hours away from the city. Okay, now I'm going to zoom into each of these cases to provide a general, uh, uh, well not a general, like a more specific account of each of these cases, and then I'm going to consolidate them and hopefully uh, be able to explain more my argument. So, in Achacachi again, nine survivors, here you see a picture taken from, from media, <laughs> of the moment in which two of the women are being walked around the city after they were punished, the homicides prosecutor of El Alto opened investigations. Um, but they were unable to completely to identify the perpetrators for several reasons. 
One of them was that they should, the, that residents from Achacachi that had a very long history of resistance to the state, and within those 10 years had actually burned or set the police station twice on fire, they uh, shut down the city and decided to call a, what, they, what they defined as a communal state of siege. That meant that nobody was able to leave or enter, especially if there were state officials. But another factor also affected the, the, the progress of this case. And the factor was that the mayor at that time became a very prominent figure in the government of, in the governmental party. And as a prominent figure, he became a senator at first and then a minister. It's possible, there's no evidence of this, but it's very likely that to protect people from his community, um, he didn't, he, he sort of thwarted attempts to continue with the case. So we're talking here about an exchange of protection, an exchange of protection from the mayor to their community, an exchange of, of votes, right? Or support, electoral support. Um, as an outcome, when I got access to the case file, in 2016 there were no indictments and the, the investigations were stagnant. The second case in Tujuyu, the father and the son, they started, they opened investigations uh, and filed a complaint at the police. They asked the Peasants' Union of the rural town where the event took place uh, to provide a report. Or the prosecutor asked the, 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 the Peasants' Union to provide a report. And they replied, officially. And they said, we demonstrate that the father and the son are being accused of stealing goods in four households. And that there is another complaint that they filed against the father and the son at your office. But the most important one here is we would like also to like to point out, point out that we not, do not have any authorization from our basis to file reports. Moreover, the Huyo community is currently under indefinite communal state of siege, again, it's the same figure as in Achacachi, and we will not allow any attack to our basis, meaning that they didn't want prosecutors uh, to intervene uh, or affect basis self-determination and sovereign decision, nor raids or invasion of territorial jurisdiction. The word territorial, the term territorial jurisdiction is key here because even before the acceptance or the full enforcement of the new constitution, this peasant union, opinion, peasant union was using the language of the constitution that allowed or described or defined the boundaries between ordinary justice and indigenous justice. So later on in the document, they refer to indigenous, the indigenous justice system that allows these union members to resolve their own problems through their, their own legal procedures, which have the same rank as the ordinary justice system. Six months later, or five months later, even with these responses, the prosecutor is still trying to uh, carry out investigations, uh, to the point that union members get tired and actually take the prosecutor and the police detective hostages, and they threaten to burn down the prosecutor office, but they actually force them to resign. After they resign, the police detective manages to carry the case file to El Alto, where the case continues, but it's completely extended. The third case, I'm going to go over this one very fast or faster. Um, so the mob, a mob murdered the alleged robber after a series of investigations carried out by the community. Residents collectively resisted the attempts of the state prosecutors to recover the body for at least 10 months. Um, to this, we should add that uh, prosecutors and uh, police contingent and ombudsman, all these actors had to be together to carry out this, the recovery of the body, and that also affected or played a role in this delay. But then, 10 months later, uh, 135 police officers contingent retrieved the target's body from the local cemetery, and the prosecutor indicted some of the suspects. But the suspects sabotaged the process. Process. They didn't show up to some of the hearings and, hearings, and in the end, they left town, so their address was unknown. Five years later, 2014, uh, it's like one of the last communications, official communications recorded in the case file, the police detective complains to the prosecutor about the lack of resources to continue with investigations. He hasn't, doesn't have any funding, any uh, cars, any support to go to all the cities where allegedly or uh, the suspects are supposedly staying. As an outcome, the case also stagnates. So in all these cases, just to start summarizing, we see that cases stagnate in the period of investigations. 
There's no accusation, there's no final accusation, so there's no trial either, and there's no sentence. So, to continue with, the, with uh, consolidating uh, this data, I'm just going to refer to what are the strategies that the perpetrators show in all these three cases, right? And I'm going to show six strategies that emerge from the, from the case file. So, the first one is collective mobilization, right? Collective resistance to attempts from state authorities to enter the community, interrogate people, um, try to carry out the normal activities that uh, investigations require to identify who did what. The second thing, based also or as a follow up to this collective mobilization, is that two communities the, the decide, or two towns decide to establish a communal state of siege, sort of to. Um, have like a more legal ground on their own terms uh, about like what is acceptable and what's not in terms of who enters the, the community and who doesn't. And in one of these cases, they actually let the prosecutor know about this official response. In the first case in Achacache, the communal state of siege is just a report from a police officer who informs the prosecutor about this situation, this ongoing situation. In the third case, there's also an official response to the prosecutor. Uh, and in all the three cases, what we see with these uh, strategies is a claim or, uh, of communi or communities reclaiming autonomy, uh, especially in the first and the third case. But in the second case, in Tukuyu, there is a specific language of Kiok, like indigenous community justice uh, and the territory that this indigenous community has, has a specific jurisdiction that is beyond the reach, beyond reach of ordinary justice. In two of these three cases, we see that the perpetrators sabotage investigations. Uh, of course, we can also say that in Tukuyu this happens as well in, in some way. Um, but in the first case, in the case of Pachacacho, where we had the mayor who became a major figure in the, political, in the main political part of the country, uh, we also see a form of patronage politics. I want to summarize this in the discussion. Uh, I'm going to be done soon, um, in the discussion in a second. Okay. Uh, so what are the strategies of the targets? These are more similar in the three cases, because the three cases. The targets reach out to the state. In two cases, they actually seek state protection from ongoing or the potential escalation of violence. Um, in Tukuyu, the targets reach out to the, pro to the prosecutor first and then to the ombudsman to tell them that they are being punished by the community. And in the, in the case of, uh, actually that's a uni, and in the, in the case of Tukuyu, there is the fear that the community who has taken the land and the car of the son is actually going to murder, murder them. The third case, uh, or the third strategy that we see, is that in all these cases, they are seeking restitution from the ordinary justice system. And we recall part of my argument at the beginning is that by requesting this uh, restitution of, in the ordinary justice system by members of these communities, we're seeing, uh, well, what's the obvious? They are acknowledging the power of state institutions and are actually demanding that these institutions enforce order in these spaces because they're being tough, because they're being uh, suffering abuses. Okay, so what does this all tell us about um, the use of Kyok and ordinary justice? Or especially, uh, more specifically, about the use of Kyok? Because we just saw how the targets legitimize or demand or request or expect the state to actually provide help to them. We see that in the case of perpetrators, Kyok, in, some, in one of the two, three cases, is used to avoid punishment from the state. They challenge the state monopoly of violence through a, uh, besides Kyok, they challenge it, challenge it through a series of strategies, collective mobilization, they go on the streets, they uh, close the communities in the countryside, they go to the state offices and ransack them and threaten the state officials that they're going to attack them, but also they're using the language or the, 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 the legal mechanism of HIOC that, was, that started in 2009. Now, there's been a lot of, uh, of discussion about whether this new legal system uh, or this form of justice has actually triggered more collective violence in, in response to crime as a form of like, getting away from punishment, sort of what I'm, what I'm showing here. However, this would be like a very narrow understanding of the role of Yacht. Because as I have shown, there are two of the three cases in which there are, the demands for autonomy do not use the language of Yacht. And in fact, if we go back to the history of these communities, especially at Chakachi, uh, 
we can see that they have been, there have been challenges to state authority uh, or push, pushbacks to state authority on several occasions through, throughout history. So there's a history, there's a repertoire of engagement with the state in which these communities that do not have weapons uh, in the way that we've been talking about uh, these last two days, but have strong organization and in front of a relatively weak state, um, they actually manage to prevent the state authorities from uh, uh, enforcing their power or enforcing law, right? So it would be limited to say that Hyok is the only cause for this. Um, what I found, however, is that Hyok becomes part of this, this repertoire, right? It opens, broadens possibilities that were already available to these groups who, saw, who sought to preserve their autonomy. Um, I just want to make two short comments here. One about, like, with this argument, I'm not trying to say that the state is not responsible, that it's too weak to enforce. I think that the state is still responsible for providing justice, especially if citizens uh, demand it. And, um, but also that we should look, on the other end, how HIOC um, also may be reinforcing inequalities within these communities. That we should go beyond the generalizing label of HIOC as a, a feature that applies to all the community and benefits the entire community in the same way. We should actually be asking who, are, who uses HIOC, who mobilizes it, under what circumstances, and with what ends. I have two more comments about violent pluralism and, uh, and violent democracies, just to engage in the conversation that we have today. Um, the first one on violent pluralism relates to, okay, we've seen that this uh, violence is, uh, is enacted or exerted by several actors, and this happens tactically. There's like a coexistence, there's a consensus, as Willis tells us in, in, in Rio, or there's negotiation, as Marcus, my, Michael Marcus Mueller tells us in, in Mexico. My question is, it's more a question than a statement, it's like, does he also show that this violent uh, pluralist, the, the, the exertion of violence could also be legitimized through legal mechanisms. And then the other issue is just going back to the, to the point of, uh, of uh, the violent democracies is that we need to account for the limitations of state institutions and as, as well as the influence of patronage politics um, in the definition of, of or the emergence of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. 21 minutes, that's okay. Um, next is uh, Francisca Ridi. Um, she is a postdoctoral researcher in the history workshop at the University of Witzbachusrand. Uh, do you have your PowerPoint? Can someone? <coughs> the title of her presentation is Popular Justice Violence and the Mobilization of Emotions in the 1990s Kephoris, um South Africa. in an area that is called Katoris, which encompassed the townships of Gatlehong, um, Tokosa, and Kosmoris. And of course, that was one of the areas that was most severely affected by escalating violence during this period. So here's a, here's a map that I pulled off the internet. You'll see that area called Ekurulemi now. That's the former East Strand where that complex is situated. Um, and here's a map. Unfortunately, I don't have um, time to go into that, but what is very specific about the violence in that area is the speciality of it. Um, with basically hostels along Kumano Street, um, building a front um, towards the township community. So the violence, at, particularly in Tokosa, was very distinct because of that speciality. And here you see a map of uh, Tokosa. So there, I don't know if you can read it, Kumano Street was basically a no-go area during um, the early 19 to mid 1990s. <clears throat> so this paper is part of a larger on, and ongoing research project on relationships between speech, collective violence, and emotions um, during the transition period in South Africa. And some of the ideas I'm going to sketch here are still fairly new, um, and so are in a very rough state. So I would very much appreciate any feedback or criticism. 
So I'm, I'm really basically just throwing ideas at you, seeing whether they might work. Um, there's a rich scholarship that has explored the different factors contributing towards the escalation of conflict during this period. So they include um, a struggle over resources, uh, the role of the third force in, in security forces in stoking the conflict, a crisis of patriarchy, competing visions of nationalism, alienation from trade unionism, political power struggles, marginalization of migrant workers, eroding networks of solidarity, rivalries between taxi associations, you see that particularly in Gatihong, um, opposition to the democratic dispensation envisaged by the ANC. So Jason Hickel has recently made the argument that some of the violence is rooted in a kind of rejection of a particular idea of democracy. <clears throat> but I would argue that while the contours of conflict have been explored in depth, the meanings and forms of the violence itself remain unexplored. So the contours of conflict and the contours of the violence don't necessarily overlap. Violence requires a particular form of agency. And so therefore the two, the two terms should not be used interchangeably. South Africa has, of course, a very long history of colonial and apartheid violence, but I don't have time to go into that either. But what we see emerging during the mid-1980s in the Natal Midlands and during the late 1980s in the area around Johannesburg is quite a distinct form of violence that is shaped or that is marked by um, a striking intimacy and, and, and its scope. So basically what you see happening is that neighbor turns against neighbor, you have entire households that come under attack, um, and eventually it claims the lives of about 20,000, depending on who you speak to, 20,000 women, children, and men. So I would like to emphasize that one of the questions that warrants greater attention is why and how people were mobilized into violent action. This is particularly the case for IFP line hostel dwellers. We know quite little about the role of Isindruna and the SPUs, the self-protection units of Ingata, in the violence the structures they relied on, and the way violence is organized. We also know quite little about the role of Amakosi um, towards the, like in relation to the subject in the urban areas, whether it's in terms of peacemaking or in terms of fueling the conflict. So in my paper, I'm going to focus on the narrative of hostile dwellers that I recently interviewed, which were, of course, just one of many groups of perpetrators. So I'm not making a point that these were the only perpetrators in this, in this case. Um, and I want to look at the way in which they explain and situate um, the violence. So here's, here's a picture of one of the hostels in Tukosa, which, by the way, is in a, is in a very dire state. Um, people have no windows, no water, no electricity, absolutely nothing. So that is still, they were basically never fixed. <clears throat> I want to propose that looking at violence through the prism of emotions can contribute towards a better understanding why and how conflict became violent and why violence took the forms it did. I am particularly focusing on fear, trepidation, anger and pride, and to a lesser extent in my projects, more largely but not in this presentation, on feelings such as um, love, exhilaration, joy, excitement, um, and all of that. Drawing on research coming out of South Asia, there's a book that's just been published literally like about two months ago, I believe. I'm interested in the dialectical relationship between mobilized emotions, so that means the manner in which emotions are worked on strategically by leaders through emotion work <coughs> and sensitizing devices, and mobilizing emotions, which means the manner in which emotions mobilize people into action. So I use the lens of emotions not to substitute um, any other explanatory frameworks, but to actually look at those frameworks in relation to emotions, so nationalism through the prism of emotions, or um, uh, political power struggles in relation to emotions. In the second step, I then want to reflect on how such a framework can contribute towards understanding violence as a form of punishment, discipline, and as a means of re-establishing social order. So these are really infant ideas that um, I'm still trying to think through. The first emotion I want to look at is fear. And here I don't mean fear that you would have to, when you see a snake, for example, this kind of immediate visceral um, form of fear, but more a sense of trepidation of something terrible is going to happen and you can't quite pinpoint what's going on. So a sort of underlying anxiety. So here I want to use one case study. 
In early 1990, a rumor was causing panic amongst hostile dwellers and rural migrants across the region, and that rumor said Amazulu will be expelled from the urban areas. Around the same time, a similar rumor created panic amongst Tosa migrant workers when they heard that all Amatosa would be sent back to the Eastern Cape after being accused of wanting to take the land of Amazulu. In response, rural migrants armed themselves and launched preemptive attacks to defend their place in the city and their livelihoods. In Tatlihon, for example, Tosa and hostile dwellers began to form self-defense units along home-based networks after hearing rumors that they would be chased away or worse. One SU command from the Eastern Cape recalls, Comrade Mandela came out in 1990. When he arrived here in South Africa, he went to all these places. And when he went, when he went to Natal, the king there didn't want to hand over the hand, basically meaning didn't want to shake his hand. So that's the first great insult, of course. Then the king there said, this Tosa guy, he's going to take over the land. And so he must kill all these Tosas. They made a secret there that we must be killed. All the Tosas, we must go back, to ho back home. And then he formed these self-defense units. For Zulu-speaking hostel dwellers, the fears of expulsion were activated when some of them were expelled from Civil King Hostel in the aftermath of widespread violence in July 1990 and further cemented when several hostels in Tukos and Katihom were demolished by neighboring communities. Soon, IFP-controlled hostels housing rural migrant workers were at war with adjacent ANC Township, ANC-aligned Township communities or communities that were safe to be ANC-aligned. Um, because a lot of the times, as we'll explain, um, people were just basically put into one group or the other, depending on where they were based. News of the expansion of IFP hostel dwellers from the gate field invented for Slora's hostel. Attacking IFP members allegedly said that, quote, they would not allow a repeat of what had happened in civil game and that they wanted revenge. So what I'm arguing here is that the perception of being under siege and under attack created a sense of trepidation and, particularly with regards to the IFP, shaped a narrative of victimhood that portrayed any acts of violence as defensive. And this is quite a crucial point. Perception of being under siege were particularly strong from around 1992 and 93, when hostels in the Katoris area were actually placed under siege. So um, there was one unit of Mkondo Assis where he actually bombed the railway line um, chief was in the hostel in Gatihong, cutting people off completely from any food, any water, any sanitation, absolutely anything. People could no longer go to work. They were physically trapped inside the hostel. Um, and in that hostel, there were quite a number of women and children as well. Fears of expulsion and physical threat were exploited by IFP leaders. Mamasutu Butelezi's wild war talk and emphasis on Zulu martial history whipped up a sheer sense of being at war. His notorious dictum, you have a right to defend yourself when you are attacked as people, played into growing perceptions of being under siege. And this is people that people people refer to that statement quite frequently when they explain what was happening at the time. Hostel dwellers attending a, a meeting at Tuba Hostel in Soweto were allegedly told by the visiting regional secretary of Ngata that a war was coming and that all Zulus were going to be attacked. A member of the Zulu royal family and senior in Duna narrates his perception of victimhood as follows. They moved to Sebogin Hostel, and on that day, everything that was Zulu was attacked. When we saw that Zulus were being attacked, that's when we met, and we said, no, you see, we are dying now. We need to do something. That is when we tried to protect ourselves, because lots of people were injured there. And that interview that I conducted around Henry was actually quite fascinating because the entire interview was around how they were being uh, victimized, how they were the victims, and how to protect themselves. The is that the Zulu monarchy values and culture were under threat, and that the land would be taken away was spreading through the urban townships on the reef. So while the narrative was instrumentalized by the leadership, fears were actualized on the ground through the burning of houses of alleged IFP members the necklacing of people, the destruction of hostels, and the expulsion of Zulu hostel dwellers from certain hostels and the townships. So here you see one of the hostels in Tokosa physically being demolished. So they actually pulled down brick by brick. In Katoris, the situation was particularly acute, and remaining neutral was no longer an option. Rural migrants from Kazula and Natal were accused of being IP supporters by virtue of their place of origins, the way they spoke, the cabins. 
Um, and some of the physical markers some of them had, such as face cards, for example, wearing these pandas. So people say that often what would happen, like people would be stopped in the street and asked, you know, like, what do you call this? And if you didn't, if you, if you refer to it in the wrong way, they knew that you were coming from a more located end. Those residing in ANC-controlled sections of the township were alleged to be supporters of the ANC. The female migrant worker who arrived from Gutter Hall as violence was escalated in 1993, recounts being chased off the house she was staying at by urban comrades who declared to be ridding the township of migrant workers from KwaZulu and Natal. <coughs> Seeking refuge at Kuzina Hostel in Gutter Hall, she became one of the many female hostel workers who were caught up in the violence. And the way she was narrating the whole story was a complete confusion as we had no idea what was going on. I still don't understand why was I being attacked. So there's something on the ground that is unfolding that has actually quite little to do with, I mean, it, it also has to do with ideology, but the, the experience of people is one of serious confusion. Fear of expulsion, physical threats, and erosion of one's way of life were therefore mobilized by the leadership to stir people into action, and it was simultaneously mobilizing people on the ground who regarded violence as a means to defend themselves and their interests. The next emotion I want to look at is anger and its relation to pride and honor. Here I want to sketch a few examples relating to train violence, drive-by shootings, and large-scale marches by IFB aligned hostel villains. Despite detailed, account, detailed accounts of transition violence, we know remarkably little about the internal logic of these marches and the way in which hostile dwellers were mobilized into violent action. As I have suggested before, hostile dwellers were often portrayed as a faceless mob that was wreaking havoc. Violence is therefore portrayed as chaotic, senseless, and random. Now my point here, and I feel like I have to say this, um, it's obviously not to legit legitimize or justify any of that violence, which by all accounts is absolutely horrific. But to understand how those who participate have made sense of it. Hostels were governed through a strict hierarchy that saw senior is in Duna at the top. They were also in, in the forefront of marches, leading and so on. So the strict hierarchy in the hostel and the institution of traditional authorities legitimated a public and collective display of certain emotions and sense of others. So basically, hostels were governed by emotional norms and formed emotional communities that relied upon constellations of emotions. Um, I'm trying to skip this one. Fear in particular was an emotion that had to be suppressed through the use of interlacing. Being fearful was being equated, was equated with being a coward. Other emotions such as anger and pride were performed, mobilized, and cemented through song and marching. In the words of Wine and Juna from Tukosa, Yes, yeah. yeah, so when we are going there, maybe as a big group, we are singing our songs, like in English, pick up your spears and hold them aloft. So you pick up the spears and hold them aloft like that. And you are singing like that, you see. The holding of the spears is a powerful symbol used in battles, a symbol that reminded the men of their heritage and history. It was therefore a means of instilling courage and pride. One song that was very popular went as follows. Nduna, do not allow anyone to disrespect you. Nduna, do not allow anyone to humiliate you. Nduna, do not allow anyone to humiliate us. Calling us dogs, we are not dogs. Dogs being Izinja. The term Ikutwenza referred to a strong form of disrespect and humiliation. Basically calling, it was a call for action. Once you, once you are disrespected to that extent, you have to almost respond. I mean, that's what was explained to me. So again, like speeches of political leaders and traditional leaders, which unfortunately I can't really um, go into here, um, these songs call for the martyrs' pride and history and their sense of honor and respect. In four strikes and songs insulting the king and the lazy deeply offended rural migrant workers, whose status with regards to age placed them above the youth of comrades. So one uh, regional SPU commander recalls, they were saying that the lazy is a sellout and all of that, so it was going to violence spread. Similar explanations were offered in relation to attacks on train commuters, as the TRC has shown. We had allegedly, like, people were attacked who were allegedly heard singing songs, insulting and ridiculing with the lazy and Isilo, the king. Other songs during big marches reminded the marches to have courage and to fight death, such as the song, I am not scared of a dead person's blood. Songs they will play a crucial role in sanctioning and mobilizing some emotions, such as pride, a sense of honor, as well as anger at being disrespected, and inhibiting others such as fear of death. 
anger of being disrespected and anger of being attacked by comrades were also actualized in drive-by shootings that saw the brutal murder of people at taxi rank and other public places. One hostile dweller, a member of an SPU, recalls how his blood would boil, perhaps one of the most common metaphors of anger. And now we would use Indelezi and then your blood will boil and you would make and make you want to kill someone and would then hijack cars and head towards the taxi rank in Jerusalem. Cycles of revenge and counter revenge plunged the cause and Kati Hong in, in, into a state of civil war. One of the most horrific incidents that triggered cycles of revenge and counter revenge was the burning of a taxi full of women arriving from Natal, leading to the death of all of its passengers around 1992. One of the Hustle Girls emphasizes that's what really escalated things and the revenge that came with it. Um, in Derby, young men from rural Kwazulu and Natal, who were frequently involved in car hijackings, taxi violence, and other forms of criminal activities played a leading role in some of the violence. Yes, it was because we had heard that there were some of our people that were injured. And then maybe if a week goes by without an attack, then those people just attack. The taxi will be attacked. And then they would say it had Zulus in it. And then we'll hear that Ingabi went out to attack. A way of concluding, let me briefly sketch some ideas about the exploration of emotions links to understanding violence as a means to re-establish social order and met our punishment. As other scholars have observed, policing of African townships during the apartheid period predominantly focused on political policing. In many areas, murder, assault, and rape, for example, rife, and popular forms of justice emerged particularly during the 1980s to punish those who were seen to violate the social norms of township communities. During the early 1990s, as violence spiraled out of control and perpetrators of the violence were hardly reported to justice, counter violence became a form of punishment. Anger of disrespect, for example, was mobilized and actualized through collective violence, which in turn aimed to, quote, put people into place, and hence re-establish a particular order. Emotions were therefore key in forming communities and drawing boundaries between insiders and outsiders. Within a context of rapid social and political change, anger and fear became salient in response to insecurity, threats, and the inversion of hierarchies. Emotions were therefore both mobilized, signaling an intention to achieve certain ends, such as security and order, for example, and mobilizing people on the ground, therefore highlighting motivation. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Um, our last speaker today, I mean, in this panel, is Nicholas Smith. He is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the City University of New York, City College. Nicholas. Thank you everybody for being here and, and uh, uh, to Bart and Paul for the invitation, all the, all the folks who have done work uh, organizing this fantastic event, but also just really enjoyed the conversations over the last few days. Um, what I'm going to present to you today is a chapter from a recently published book, um, or a book I recently published called uh, Contradictions of Democracy, Vigilantism and Rights in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Um, and the book uh, uh, largely explains or tries to explain uh, why vigilantism has become a, com a relatively common form of violence uh, since, since democratization, and as we've heard, it certainly predates it too. But, but what explains, in some sense, is its perpetuation um, since the end of, the part of, of apartheid, despite this extraordinarily positive political change. Um, most of the book looks at the kind of underlying logics that, that, that push people to take the law into their own hands. Um, parts of it look at um, how we can use vigilantism to understand the functioning of the state itself. Uh, but today I'm going to present a chapter that looks at, at some of the meanings of vigilantism um, for those who engage in forms of extra legal crime fighting, and particularly the risks that they face, which are, which are frankly often uh, underappreciated. Um, so this is largely a story of one um, um, street committee leader. When Bikela was shot, few people were surprised, least of all Bikela himself. As a street committee leader in Guamashu, which was at the time South Africa's murder capital, <coughs> Michaela knew well that his crime-fighting activities put him at great risk of violent reprisal. After all, attacks against those involved in community policing were common. A young member of Guamashu's community policing forum, for instance, had recently been killed by local gangsters the CPF had been pursuing. <coughs> and the fact that residents of the street were known for a particularly rough form of crime-fighting made Michaela's involvement in the street committee all the more risky. So when the night finally arrived that he was shot, the question that most residents were asking over the next several days 
was not why Mikhail had been shot, but rather who exactly had ordered the hit. By contrast, the question I was perplexed by was why Mikhail would knowingly and willingly open himself to such risk in the first place. Now, while uh, supporters, uh, while perpetrators and supporters of extra legal crime fighting were often condemned in both popular media and academic writing, much less recognized of the risk crime fighters themselves face. For example, early in my research, a well-known German environmental activist told me his house had been firebombed in retaliation for his attempts to reduce neighborhood drug dealing. Even citizen crime fighters who were backed by the state by way of membership in local community policing forums can find themselves targeted by criminals. CPF members in each of the townships where I conducted to conduct the majority of my research, for instance, were killed during the time I worked there, despite the fact that they were ostensibly afforded protection by their affiliation with the police. So given up such a likelihood of violent reprisal, it's puzzling that anyone would engage in extra legal crime fighting. Why take the risk? Now, one possibility suggested by studies that connect vigilantism to poor policing would be a lack of faith in the local police. Fed up with the inability of police to lower crime, one might hypothesize a crime fighter would be compelled to step in because of the state's failure. Such a theory, however, does not help us account for why an individual would choose not to free ride and put his or her personal safety at risk for the betterment of the wider community. A second possibility, consistent with studies that connect vigilantism to political mobilization, would be that vigilantes might use their crime-fighting fame to generate some form of political support. Now, such a claim holds much truth in, in parts of South Africa, but this argument provides less leverage on why crime-fighting would be the preferred method through which uh, to mobilize, which would be mobili uh, politicians would mobilize support, when one could presumably rally supporters through less ri risky activities like, say, campaigning against poverty. The third possibility, suggested by work on policing uh, and community policing here in Johannesburg, is that the safety in numbers created by collective crime fighting may have a kind of self-perpetuating logic, as participants would become uh, targets for reprisal if they stop patrolling. Now, while this perspective offers an important insight on why crime fighters would continue engaging in risky crime fighting once they've begun, it offers less, less leverage on why would-be crime fighters uh, on, on their initial decision to take part in such a risky activity. So, um, in what follows, I'm going to argue that the Michaela case suggests a different possible motivation. That is, the emotional rewards that, that extra legal crime fighting provides, and there's some hallmark or some, some resonances with what Francisco was just telling us about. So, for Michaela, to fight crime, even if it meant occasionally using force against criminals, meant being a good community member, an ideal that carried an emotional satisfaction. His street is, an intimately interconnected, is intimately interconnected, where residents' lives are economically, socially, and morally linked. Yet the intimate nature of these connections are often remarkably contradictory, as neighbors have to rely on one another and therefore have the potential to harm one another. Efforts at informal crime fighting have to be inserted into the middle of these social relationships, which is a potentially dangerous undertaking. But for the Michaela, being active in his neighborhood allowed him to shape these relationships and make them more harmonious, which gave his life meaning. Criminality, to his mind, was communally injurious and needed to be stamped out. And crime fighting was one mechanism by which one could produce a morally upright community, an ideal which had a long genealogy stretching back uh, at least to the communal crime, crime fighting of the apartheid era, and which, as I'm going to discuss elsewhere in the book, or have discussed elsewhere in the book, uh, has been actively promoted by, promoted by state appeals for citizens to take charge of crime in their own communities. So this is part of a broader, and this emotional response, I'm going to argue, is part of a broader stakeholding um, project. Indeed, the emotional rewards that, that Mikhail experienced from his crime fighting were profoundly shaped by his participation in anti-apartheid politics and post-apartheid membership in the ANC and South African Communist Party. Therefore, rather than being innate internal states, the emotional rewards of Michaela experience must be understood by the political and social context in which he was placed. So for Michaela, that context is the struggle, is the violent struggle against uh, of, of late apartheid, the early formation of the democratic state, and the disciplinary practices of the ANC and SACP, organizations that promoted dis uh, participatory crime fighting as an effective way to bring down crime rates, improve the moral health of local communities, and spur civic engagement. Put differently, the moral satisfaction Michaela felt was at least partially the outcome of a larger state-building project. 
So in this sense, his community uh, involvement approximated the ideal of a social capital fostering good citizen. <laughs> However, the argument that informal crime fighters might use violence out of a sense of citizenship and a deep, uh, a deep commitment to community flies in the face of most sociological research on vigilantism. In fact, for many scholars, vigilantism is most likely to occur when the bonds of trust that characterize strong attachments to country or to community have collapsed. Vigilantism on this common understanding is the opposite of civil society and the emotional satisfaction vigilantism provides is the satisfaction of vengeful furies. The Bekele case suggests the opposite. Indeed, he has, long, he has been a long-standing pillar of his neighborhood, and his crime fighting was to him both a way to be a good citizen of a liberal South African state and an expression of, a, of, a, of the commitment built into a communal ideal. Indeed, one might call Bekele a, a Durkheimian who's, who's likely never read Durkheim. Yet the tactics which he has used to, to fight crime straddle an awkward borderline between procedural and proceduralist law often bringing his crime fighting into conflict with the dictates of the state's legal system. The Bekele was a loyal member of the ANC, a party that was instrumental in bringing democracy into being, highlights the uneasy relationship between law, extra-legal crime fighting, and citizenship in post-apartheid South Africa. The emotional benefits that Bekele experienced from crime fighting, which pushed him to engage in risky personal behavior for the perceived betterment of the community, sit uncomfortably next to the rationalized legal procedures enshrined in South Africa's celebrated constitution. In short, while vigilante violence provides emotional satisfaction, paradoxically, the satisfaction may be more connected to the virtues of the citizen than the vices of the mob. But in order to understand the civic satisfaction in action, we need to understand more about this, his street, the intimate bot ties that bind the street together, and most importantly, I think, how the hit on Michaela emerged out of it. Now, even if you weren't, uh, uh, weren't on the local street committee, Michaela would be a prominent member of, the, of his neighborhood because of the tuck shop he owns. And, and this is not his tuck shop, it's a, it's a typical tuck, tuck shop in Bomashu, somewhat similar to his, to his store. On the night he was shot, Michaela had been away from the store attending a local <coughs> council meeting, leaving the shop in his wife's charge. While attending to her customers, his wife noticed two young men whom she did not know hanging around the street near the store, something of a curious activity in the otherwise tight-knit street. Stranger still, the two men waited until Michaela returned home to approach the store. And they asked for several small items, but apparently didn't seem intent on following through with the purchases. Michaela, apparently sensing trouble, asked his wife to go inside the home and dish him up a plate of food. After his wife entered the house, the two young men fired their guns several times. Michaela's wife rushed out of the house, only to find him face down in the shipping container bleeding from his leg. The two men had fled. A bullet had entered Michaela's leg and passed out the other side, shattering the bone in the process. Fortunately, he lived, though his injuries required a long hospital stay and rehabilitation. Now, who, who shot Michaela remains a mystery to this day, and Michaela is, is fine letting the incident rest in the past at this point. What is evident, however, is that the circumstances surrounding the shooting are suspicious. We asked Michaela's wife a, a, few days, um, a few days after the shooting if it could have been a clumsy robbery. She was convinced it was not. Although the two young men had taken some money, she was positive they did so only to mask what this, this act really was, which was a paid hit. Now, her suspicions seemed reasonable. It was well known that several young men who were under the livings illegally were unhappy with Michaela because of his leadership at the street committee. And it's curious that the two, shop, the, the two shooters would wait for Michaela to return to the store rather than, than attack his, his small black. Michaela's a, a large and kind of imposing person. But this all raises the question, against this background of a known and imminent, imminent threat, why would he put his life, life on the line by fighting crime? Now, to answer this question, a little background about his street is useful. It's a remarkably intimate neighborhood where residents have long, decades-long, at this point, relationships with one another. Much of the intimacy is built on the back of the neighborhood's robust informal economy, where residents can access virtually any service available in the formal economy, but at a, at a relative discount. Now, much of this informality, however, also, in some instances at least, involves vice or crime. So this particular street has long been an incubator of taunted car thieves, for instance. Um, there, are, there are a variety of drug dealing activities, uh, other people ran uh, illegal dice games uh, in the neighborhood. And what this meant 
was that, that profits from vice are often funneled back into businesses of other upright, otherwise upright community members. Now, the street committee had to insert itself into this tightly knit, tightly linked world of economic and social need, which is a very dangerous undertaking. <coughs> Shutting down a legal business, after all, is not just ending a socially undesirable activity, it is cutting off a family from a vital economic resource that can help that family make ends meet. It's also taking action against one's neighbor with, one, with whom one's own family might have decades of history. Indeed, in the days following the event, rumors circulated about various small-time local criminals with whom, the street, with whom the street committee had been in conflict. Now, the neighborhood's intimacy in this sense has a double-edged quality to it. It allowed greater cooperation to solve corrective, collective problems like crime, while simultaneously enabling a forceful response to collective action, uh, to this collective action by those being targeted. Indeed, members of the street committee were convinced that the street committee meetings were filled with informants sent by local criminals to learn about the street committee's plans so that criminals could respond accordingly. Now, it, it may or may not be true that this is the case, that the suspicion may be far-fetched, far but the general perception that it's true that there are spies in these street committee meetings reveals much about the assumption of risk one takes in joining the street committee and the fear that even one's closest allies in the neighborhood can engender. As a street committee member told me at one point, quote, to join the street committee, you have to be prepared to die. So, so against this background of potentially deadly violence, why would one take the risk of joining the street committee, much less becoming a leader of it like Michaela? Now, the same emotional bonds that tied the neighborhood together, even if those bonds were highly contradictory, also enabled, also enabled individual risk-taking to improve it. In risking his personal safety, Michaela could work to create the purified community he, saw, he, he thought the street should have, no matter how unlikely it was ever to be achieved. Indeed, Michaela changed his economic prospects in part out of concern about the effects of, a, of an older business he had on the moral composition of his neighborhood. As it turns out, at one point, Michaela had owned the largest illegal tavern in the neighborhood in the, in the period shortly uh, following the end of apartheid. Now, although it was shut down after a police raid, he decided not to try and legalize the tavern in part because, uh, he told me, in part because of the violence such businesses could create. So his involvement in, the, in informal crime control emerged out of this full moral forthrightness and a desire good, for good living. Uh, he told me, quote, in myself, I don't like bad things in my area, like crime. I don't support, support crime, so I'm a man which is active. And even if, it, if the outcome of this crime fighting was fatal, not giving up, fight, up the fight, his, not giving up the fight uh, gave his life a certain meaning. He told me, quote, you got some hearsay or some remarks, but you didn't say, hey, I'm sick of, the, of these structures or this position. I better give up this possession or I'll die. I know that I will die, but if I die for the truth, no problem. Now, even while he presented himself as a moral stalwart in the community, his community involvement had a certain contradictory quality to it. On the one hand, as well as street committee and chairman involved, educating people about their rights, including the procedures through which the case is supposed to be reported and investigated by the police. Involvement in the street committee was, therefore, a way for him to impart a knowledge of such rights to his neighbors and served as a kind of civic duty tied, to the to, tied up in trans transmission of democratic and communal ideals to the wider neighborhood. Yet at the same moment that he has supported the civic political program, he was uncomfortable about some of the effects these procedures, these, these criminal political uh, procedures, uh, legal procedures, had on, some of, on solving the neighborhood's crime problems. For example, in the months leading up to the shooting that I've been discussing, residents of this street had beaten suspected thieves to death on two separate occasions for stealing copper taps from outside of people's homes. And when I asked Michaela what led to such incidents, he explained them as a result of precisely the same legal procedures he took pride in educating people about. As he said, quote, if you call the police in that situation, the police come and they say, okay, we'll arrest this person, but who's going to come to the court to witness? In the community, no one, no one wants to go to, to do that because the first thing it is going to do is cost you your money to go to court, your time. At last, the police say there's no evidence. So then they say, no, you must leave this case and go home. In other words, the cumbersome legal procedures and inherent fallibility of calling the police and, and going through the court system presents roadblocks to the real, realization of justice and the removal of criminal threat from the neighborhood. 
Now, tellingly, as Vikela relayed this explanation for, for his neighborhood's um, um, involvement in vigilante justice, his voice was elevated, hearing a tone of frustration and anger. Importantly, however, his anger was at the procedures involved with the dealing with the police. So in other words, Vikela shared some of the same suspicion of new constitutional rights dispensation as some other members of the neighborhood, despite being ostensibly charged with educating the neighborhoods about these very same rights. So to, to conclude, this tension between procedural and proceduralist law is also having consequences for how the institutions of the law function itself. Particularly when it comes to the police, they're forced to negotiate their presence in local communities. For example, although police came to the scene of both of these lynchings I mentioned, they didn't arrest anybody. And when I asked Michaela why not, he suggested they quote, you know, the police did not arrest anybody because this pipe stealing had been reported several times before this happened. So if you kill the suspected police, uh, the suspected thief, excuse me, the police will say, hey, this guy's been troubling the community a long time. Let him go. Let him put it on the community's head and see what they do. Now, whether or not Michaela is giving an incomplete insight into the officer's thinking, in his answer, there seems to be a negotiation with the police implicitly, implicitly letting people go because the police, like the neighborhood, see the criminal law as the, as the problem, uh, not, as, not the vigilante justice necessarily. Now, of course, this is not com overtly communicated when such violence happens. On the contrary, uh, to, to Michaela, when such killings happen, he, he told me, quote, they always advise community, police always advise community, hey, you mustn't take it all into your, own, into your own hands, you must report. But they must say that, because they can't say, hey, you must kill this person. Right? Regardless of the mixed messages, the combination of overt disapproval and implicit approval through, acts, through the lack of arrests in these incidents implicate the police in the continuation of street justice in the neighborhood. And the sum effect of all this is a contradictory pattern of state formation in which informal crime fighters embody ideals of good citizenship while potentially undermining the rights afforded to fellow citizenship to citizens which, push, which pushes the state's agents to tacitly approve of this illegal justice. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Um, and thank you to uh, the three of you for a very interesting panel. There are clear echoes between uh, some of your presentations. And we have five minutes for discussion, so this is great. Um, <laughs> okay, we're. Okay. Is it okay, Carl, if we go until 1 10, 1 15? Okay. 1 10. 1 10. Okay, we're closing at 1 10. All right, sounds good. Um, questions? This one, Desmond. Yeah, one in the back. And Mike. Well, I just wanted to pose a question to Jorge and, and Nick. One thing that I noticed in, in your talks that, that maybe didn't appear so much in other talks that I've heard is, is sort of the gaps between different organizations, right? So when, you, so when I look at shanty towns in Latin America, very often the people who are enforcing vigilante justice sort of run the community, right? And a lot of the, the readings that I've done, there aren't necessarily criminals out there watching, uh, watching that. Uh, who, are, who are engaged in these sort of contradictory violence and pushback. You don't get so many violent dialogues. You get one group that's doing something. And in her case, I, sort of, I saw this emerging in terms of the way in which people were dealing with the local justice system, but then also at different times sort of moving up in the state justice system. So people sort of moving across formal and informal registers, or in the case of Nick's presentation, multiple informal registers, as they advance their different uh, violent and, and less violent agendas. And I guess I wanted you to reflect on, on the, the spaces of contradiction and the gaps and the importance they have in the creation of, of these localized orders and sensitivities that you're talking about. OK, there were other hands. Yes, the gentleman in front. OK, thank you. Quickly, I have a question and go, a question and a comment from the go to Francisco. Um, <clears throat> In your presentation, of course, there are a whole lot of other details that you mentioned, but I picked up the way in Deleuze, you know, the, the cocktail, you know, that makes people brave or invincible or depending on who you talk about. Um, why did you explore more the role of the traditional healers? Uh, because, of course, you know, they may be the main source of this particular cocaine. 
So I thought maybe it'd be interesting just to really maybe look at it. Um, something that didn't come out very clear is um, the whole question of tribalism and, uh, and the whole thing. I'll be keen maybe to hear more. Thank you. Um, there's a lady to the right. I've really got two comments in relationship to the last two presentations, and you know, some said it might also reflect my positionality, but when I look, and I understand particularly, Francesca, that your work is work in progress, but it would seem to me that to only look at the emotions associated with the Inkata, IFP, KZM originators, um, while, in a sense, what Katurus represented was actually the heart of the civil war, not between the IFP or the Inkatas or the whatever and uh, the township residents that, or the, the closest speaking people, but between an apartheid state that was desperate to survive um, and uh, a community and communities that were resisting. And so I think the, all those other reasons that you gave are very valid and important reasons. And somehow the issue about the role of emotions and violence needs to be integrated into that analysis, not as a separate analysis. Which brings me then to Nick's presentation where again, you say, well, there are these reasons. And then you say there's an alternative explanation. Um, and, you know, I hear what you say about emotional rewards, and I, and I, you know, I don't know if it's also about your positionality, interview this, what's his name? Oh, well, I call him the cable, that sounds like, that's what I call Anyway, um, because, you know, I, and I listen to his story, and I even listen to his responses, um, he might be telling you, oh yes, uh, you know, that this, you might be getting that sense of emotional reward. But I just see this guy, in the absence of a failing state and ineffective policing, is that this is his rational response, being part of a vigilante group, to protect his small business. Um, and, you know, and he's, he might portray it as a civic duty, but underneath that civic duty is a sense of survival and self-preservation. All right, maybe we, we can get the answers to that. So, um, thank you for these comments and questions. So, the role of Indonesia was very crucial um, on different sides. So, it's not just the hostile relatives, but also in the SGU guys also talk about using Indonesia to kind of feel um, less fear. I find it's something that that is quite difficult, and I'm, I mean, that now speaks to something that I'm permanently reflecting on, right? Is if you're not an insider, it's quite <coughs> difficult to really gain more information about that, because I kind of try to probe people about, you know, like the really different procedures and all of that, and a lot of the times people just say, we were using, we were washing with little lazy, but we wouldn't really go into detail. So that's something I still need to, or will try to explore further if possible. Um, the role of tribalism, of course, some of the most conventional accounts during that time was to claim that there was a sort of ancient dispute or hatred between Zulu people and, and Bossa people, which, of course, is nonsense, right? But the way people, or the, the way certain sentiments were constructed during this period kind of plays into certain prejudices. So, you know, like, for example, speaking about the Third Force, you would find these pamphlets that were claiming, you know, like, the Zulus are going to do this, don't trust the Tosa. So you can see how these prejudices were exploited by, by the security forces to kind of stoke a sort of so-called tribalistic um, component of the conflict. Um, and then um, your, your question or comment about looking at emotions only. So, and I suppose that's just an easy way out. <laughs> But of course, I mean, my research doesn't just look at emotions. What I was trying to do in this presentation, for the sake of keeping to 20 minutes, is like zoom in on like certain aspects 
But in my much broader research project, I'm looking at the role of the third force, I'm looking at the role of the police, I'm looking at all these different aspects. What does the struggle of over resources actually mean on the ground? What type of nationalism emerges? Um, but I found like if I try to integrate it here, as I say, it's maybe a bit of an easy answer, I would not have been able to have enough time to actually zoom in. Because what I wanted to do at this point was to to kind of try and reflect on what mobilized people on the ground. Because even though you have the third force obviously playing a huge role, um, which has still not been explored in detail, I do think that doesn't actually, if we talk about the third force, it doesn't explain why Mr. So-and-so takes up his weapons and marches in the street. So what I'm trying to do is like, at a very sort of micro level, understand what mobilizes people. But yes, I mean, I take your point. Of course, you can't, I mean, my project is not just about looking at emotions that would be way too narrow. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for those um, comments. So, um, so uh, for, for Desmond, yeah, it, it, it's interesting that, that you haven't seen, that, that, that the spaces that you're working in Latin America have this, this seeming kind of single, you know, monopoly uh, of, of, a, of, of violence by, by an organization. Because, at least in my experience in South Africa, there's, there's extraordinarily high levels of contestation. Um, I mentioned a few incidents at the beginning of my talk but to give you a, a sense of, of, of how extraordinary this pushback can be in some instances. Um, I think it was maybe in 2017 in an um, informal settlement in Cape Town over a weekend, something like 21 people were killed between, um, I think it was like 11 CPF members and 10 alleged gang members as part of, of, part of a, a state of violence. Um, in uh, in a, a, a community policing forum not so far from here, somebody was beheaded as part of their, their patrolling activity. As I mentioned, people in both the townships where I worked have been killed. Um, and so this, there's, there's, there's high, high levels of contestation. And I think this in a way comes to the second um, um, question, um, which uh, about a sort of sense of survival. Um, so, so I agree with that. Um, and I, I, I hope it came through in my presentation that part of what I'm trying to suggest here is, is how profoundly insecure a place like Polmashu is. Uh, not only for this particular individual, but for so many people who live on the, on the street uh, that, that I'm describing here. And that's not only a physical uh, insecurity that that's the case, but also uh, a, a deep economic insecurity uh, and, and a kind of moral insecurity, um, too. So, um, in, in, the, in his case, you know, why is he explaining this in terms of a kind of moral desire? And, and, and to, to your question, you know, isn't this really about sort of protecting a, a small business and economic lifeline? Um, you know, I think there's certain things that part of, of why I don't think that's a complete explanation is he's, he's actually been involved in many, many, many kinds of civic activities. So the CPF is only part of what he does. Um, some of those do have a business relationship, but some of those are like local, um, like kind of council related things. Um, and so he's, he's, he's long been a, a, a just a kind of civically active person. And, and so I actually take him at his word that this is one, one expression of that. And the other thing is, is about, the, the, to go to the point about, well, isn't this just the state failing? Um, yes, the, the, the South African state could do many things much better, um, particularly around issues of crime and security. Um, to, to say the least. Um, with that said, it, it still doesn't explain why a, some particular individuals take these extraordinary risks and some don't, given that so many people on the street experience profound insecurity and not just him. And I think that's why um, I'm focusing on his, his, his interest in civic involvement, and particularly the way in which that civic involvement is, is channeled and has been fostered by, by the civic agency and SACP. Um, and, and its connection to, to the liberation movement is, is a useful explanation. All right, thank you for the question. Um, we'll go over to Desmond's uh, question. Uh, well, I think that um, the best way to, to, to explain like, how this uh, gap shapes subjectivities is by referring to the, the branch of the literature on state and indigenous peoples' relations that sort of place indigenous peoples in this position of um, struggle, resistance, um, and oppression at the same time. So, this narrative tells us that indigenous peoples have been able to resist and maintain their own forms of governance and their own mechanisms, mechanisms of justice, um, sort of hiding from the state or trying to reject the state, the state presence. 
Um, what I'm trying to show here is that the problem with this narrative is that there are two problems with this narrative. One is that it flattens out communities and just tries to present them as sites of uh, horizontality and communality where everybody has uh, shares the same interests. And, and the other one is that it shows us that there is a separation between indigenous community uh, justice system in this case or uh, ordinary justice system. So what I'm trying to show here is that uh, first there are hierarchies between these communities. Um, hierarchies that show that there are different interests, that there are clashes within these communities, and that there are, they are basically embedded in power relations between uh, among individuals uh, that are part of these communities. And the other one is that, uh, I don't know why so far we haven't been able to do what we have done with uh, religion in, in Latin America, which is, well, we know there is syncretism, individuals believe in uh, Mother Earth, Mother Earth and our Catholics at the same time. Uh, I'm trying to apply that perspective to understand also the operation of justice. Yes, we have like, our own mechanisms that work for some things, and that has been uh, the case for a long time, but we also are modern individuals that can uh, engage with the ordinary justice system as any other um, modern citizen would do. Thank you. All right. Other questions? Yes. Carl? Uh, who's, who's hanging the mic? Okay, so there's... Yes, thanks. Uh, it's a really interesting series of presentations. Um, and and uh, what's, what's interesting to, to note is the shift from violence that's much closer to the state to kinds of situations that have been described here where there's a kind of popular appropriation uh, of violence but then sometimes in an ambiguous relationship with the state. Um, so my, I, I think my comment, so, so I, I've actually got a small question for Nicholas because in, his, in your first presentation I, I thought this guy was a a vigilante, and then your answer to one question, you talked about the CPF. Okay. And those seem to me to be kind of quite distinct. There's a bit of work I hope I can present later, which, which indicates that. Um, but in the South African case, there's a deep history of historical rejection of, uh, of the law of the oppressor, the law of the colonial state. Um, and that's, that's got very deep kind of precedents that go back to, I suppose, indigenous assertions as well. But I'm thinking of the more recent past, uh, the struggle for people's power and people's courts, through which the ANC and affiliated organizations were attempting to disorganize the law of the apartheid state and establish people's courts, which again um, often appealed backwards to one or other notion of indigenous law. And it seems to me that that's part of what accounts for the shallow roots of, the, of current law in communities and the ability of, of people, individuals, groups, communities, networks to move backwards and forwards between appropriating the law and rejecting the law. I'm wondering whether something similar exists, uh, Jorge, in the, in the case of Bolivia, where you are talking about indigenous people. You know, so on the one hand, you talked about the, the relation between a recent innovation legally and yok, right? But yok is a reference to a body of uh, 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 codes around justice which had a long history, pre-colonial pre as well as in the colonial period. And I'm wondering to what extent that, so whether people refer to yok or not is a tactical issue, but whether people's uh, uh, quest for autonomy hasn't got these much more deeper and more uh, tacitly understood, or maybe explicitly understood roots in, in that kind of history, a history of resistance. And in some ways that comes, Francesca, to your, you know, your talk, which, which I found really interesting. I mean, one of the, I mean, for, certainly for, the, for, the, for our visitors from afar, uh, they might not be familiar with the, with the particular history of the hospitals uh, and Zulu migrant workers in Encarta. In fact, I'm sure that most of them won't be familiar. Uh, and the way that um, you know most sociologists and historians have approached this question almost entirely from the, the the kind of point of view, more or less, of what we call the progressive movement, not of this reactionary movement, if I can put it that way. So working with the hostile dwellers, and you know, I think it's really important to get that kind of perspective um, from participants from the other side. What I'm interested in is whether this 
as, as with the other two presentations, whether there was any notion of justice uh, involved in this kind of mobilization. I mean, what is the relation between some of the emotions that you're talking about uh, and questions of grievance and injustice, uh, or, or perhaps of different notions of justice uh, that have been trampled on? All right. Um, there was a gentleman in the back. Sorry. Yes, he was raising his hand for a while. Um, yeah. Thank you to the panel. Tabo, I want to ask you a few questions. Um, just on the, the presentation that Dr. Uh, Kaporos, um, I think I want to think through what you articulated while I'm working through in the emotion, the emotion work and trying to and also having um, sensitizing registers. Um, you know, Kumara, the, the Kumara example for me, it's, it's, um, it speaks of a place to all. There's, there's obviously a need for spatial development there, and there's a need, there's, 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 the example speaks of a way of living that was afforded to, to working class uh, South Africans at a particular time. And you make this example that there's, there's kind of like a migration between the urban center and rural uh, contexts. Do you think there could have been any positives that could have, could have come out of that, that kind of like my, uh, that migratory relationship in, in taking a question around our course and what their role was? Um, because I, mean, I, I, I would be interested to, to, to think through uh, what kind of like uh, cultures, uh, practice uh, professions, and cultures of, of, of work that, that could exist in such a space. So, um, you know, in, in Alex, uh, there's a history of um, uh, families uh, of different ethnic origins that, uh, you know, that are really interested in, like, in health inspection work. And uh, has that come out in, in, in looking at, uh, have, you, have you explored that in, in looking at the, the, the different relationships between rural and urban center? So, do you think Amakosi could have perhaps been involved in that kind of thing um, in terms of public health? Okay, uh, we have time for one last question. I don't know, there was a hand over there. Yeah, sure. Well, I, it's time, okay. Hey, Francesca, I'm quite interested in your, in your presentation. Uh, I think it was maybe for selfish reasons because I covered those uh, wars and uh, Find myself caught in them quite a few times, and even several times, especially on Kumana Road, as you say. The, when you talk about the marginalization of migrant workers, I think it might also factor in the fact that at some point the hostels were actually being used by the IFP in order to create a political presence in there. So, if, for example, a, a hostel in Soweto is called a Meraf hostel, and then they will use it to claim a branch in, in the product township. So they will, they will not say, uh, they'll say, Muletani, uh, uh, no, uh, they will call it Mateja branch of the IP in order to, to give an impression that they should have a presence there. And also, quite important to still remember that those hostels were for uh, single migrant men and not necessarily all of them. They all came from all over the country, the poor boys, I didn't have to leave. And when you explore the relationship between the Indunas, Indunas, the Indunas is actually a formula, the chief's formula, where it's translated. And the role that played uh, in the connection between the hostels, no, the township, and uh, the chiefs, where, where they come from. You, I think you do well to find there's a man who was, uh, Mr. Lamona, who was in the Induna at a Marath hostel. If he's still alive, and that's, a, that's like a mind, a gold mine, if you can find it. I don't know, his name must, might have been Aaron, but Aaron pays much, pays much value on the name Aaron. Uh, All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. So we have 10 minutes. That means about. And we'll keep up. Okay. Um, my answer will be shorter because I only have one, one question uh, in relation to whether like, these examples or these cases that I show or, or I show um, the reforms that took place in Bolivia uh, show like a deepening of the autonomy of these communities. Um, I think there are two ways in which we've answered this question. 
One of them, of course, is looking into like the actual constitutional reforms and how the state now recognizes the Bolivian state is a plurinational state that acknowledges the existence of 39, 39 indigenous nations, which is an update, an upgrade. Uh, I don't know if there's a hierarchy, but a step forward from multicultural policies that only recognize the existence of uh, customs by indigenous people. So in a sense, we can say, yeah, like the recognition of Hyok is a, a step forward. However, we should ask as well whether this is an actual deepening of uh, autonomy or a strategy of governance that is useful for the government. Yeah. In terms of... Can I just clarify? Sorry, I, yeah. was, I wasn't talking about the reforms. Oh, okay. I was talking about this, the, 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 the movement from communities mm -hmm. to appropriate justice yeah. and keep the states out, whether that is linked to deeper histories of colonial resistance and so on. It is, it is. And that's probably like the second part of, of my response, because we can see that uh, uh, indigenous communities have been doing this for a long time, um, with the state presence or without state, the state presence. Um, the thing is, um, that brings a lot of other problems, right? Um, mainly referring to, okay, if we're going to be using appropriating violence or justice, taking justice into our own hands, and now we have the official legal recognition of our justice, who is benefiting from this form of justice? Um, is it the community, or is it that we are uh, allowing powerful individuals to reproduce their power or to enhance or to increase it in relation to arms? Um, okay, so, uh, so um, I'll, I'll be curious to hear uh, the, the distinction you make between vigilantes and CPS, because at least the way that I, I conceptualize vigilantes in the book is extra legal punishment, and there are many CPS that engage in precisely that, um, um, albeit under often ambiguous conditions. So, so, so it's certainly not true of every CPF, or certainly not every CPF member, but, but certainly some do. And, that's actually part of what I try to do in the book is, is track these often ambiguous and, and frankly hyper contradictory lines um, in which those with the imprimatur of the state often end up actually violating the state's um, procedures and or that when they do so, uh, I, I, I talk about this in other chapters in the book, um, that you know, if, if there's a say an assault on, a, on an electric criminal, that they'll try to do so in certain ways that make it difficult to detect because they're very aware that the criminal, um, as, as Jorge's uh, presentation pointed out, could lodge charges against CPF members. And so they're very aware of these shifting lines. Um, and that's, that's where some of this, a lot of this ambiguity comes into life. On, on the second point about the shallow roots of law um, in these communities, I'd actually say something different, which is that the law is actually very present. Um, and, and a guy like Tequila, um, is, is, is really in some ways quite an embodiment of it. So, so um, I talked about a little bit in the presentation, there's more in the, in the full chapter, but, but a big part of his job is, is sort of promoting rights consciousness for lack of a better, a better way to describe it. And, and he talked to me about you know, taking or helping people file, file cases and things like that. But there's also then, again, this ambiguous relationship to how the law often functions and practice in these spaces. And, and somebody like him, this is not only him, it's many other people, both on the street and in other places where I work, have to figure out how to negotiate this in, in situations of profound insecurity, right? Uh, so to give you a sense of that insecurity, as, as I mentioned, this case was reported to the police. They ultimately have, have not caught whoever was ostensibly responsible for this act. And, and at a certain point, you know, he just let it drop because the consequences of pursuing it potentially are actually so much greater. And so it's actually this constant negotiation and navigation that citizens themselves have to face, which is a, a little bit what I'm, I'm trying to get through, both in the book generally, but, but also in this chapter. Right, thank you for all these questions. Um, so Carl, in relation to different notions of justice and if people have a sense that the justice was violated and maybe that kind of violence was a form of justice, it's something I'm trying because initially I thought this talk was going to be a lot about that and then I realized actually I would just be guessing, right? Um, because I'm not entirely sure if, we, if we're not talking more about revenge than justice or perhaps the, the question would be what is the relation between revenge and justice? And I'm not entirely sure about that, it's something I do need to work on much more. Um, Taro, so this is a really interesting question about the Malagama Kosi and something that I actually can't answer because I, I have a sense that there's, there's not that much information about what kind of 
responsibilities do Amakasi have in urban areas towards their subjects? So it's something that I, I take as a comment at this point, something that I need to reflect on much more. Um, but yes, I think this is really an important aspect. And then, second panel, sorry. <laughs> Um, so yes, the, the IFP was simply using the hostels to kind of try and find the support. And I think it's particularly, particularly the case in Katoris, which had a very large percentage of, of, uh, of Zulu speakers. Um, so one of the things, for example, I was trying to determine at some point is like, why is the violence in the Wild Triangle, for example, to some extent different to the violence in Katoris? Um, because you see certain similarities, you see differences as well. And I think part of the reason, of course not the entire uh, reason, has to do with demographics and the kind of spatiality of these areas. Um, and so at that point, there were of course these kind of attempts to make a tourist the headquarters of the IFP. Apparently Tim Bacosa was making statements around to that effect that the East Strand, then East Strand, would become the kind of stronghold of the IFP. Um, and they also tried to very aggressively recruit um, Zulu speaking Zulu speakers who are actually urbanized. So one of the SGU commanders I interviewed, for example, who is um, uh, of Zulu origin but grew up in the urban areas, he uh, refused to join the IFP. And then basically, again, maybe what was a, an act of revenge, his entire family, or almost his entire family, was killed. Um, so it was a very aggressive recruitment drive at that time, with um, with the hostels being at the centre. Um, and then, but again, I mean, this role, the, the connection between Zinduna and Amakasi is something I'm still trying to work through by talking to um, Zinduna at the moment, well, not right now, but um, I'm going to talk to them again, and I'm hoping to travel to more rural areas to perhaps speak to some of the Amakasi there. Alright, thank you so much. Um, we even uh, finished two minutes before 1.10, so now we can break and have lunch. I'll see